Just about 44 minutes after the hour of 6 o'clock, welcome back to the Now Morning Show on this Wednesday morning. Now, according to the World Health Organization, an estimated 703,000 people a year take their life around the world. For every suicide, there are likely 20 other people making a suicide attempt, and many more have serious thoughts of suicide. Now, since we observed World Suicide Prevention Day on September 10th, we wanted to bring in someone to discuss suicide, its causes, and how we can prevent it. And joining us to talk more about this is Managing Director of Therapeutic Spaces, Counseling and Psychotherapy, Dr. Crystal Jean Verasami. Dr. Verasami, good morning. Thank Hi. you so much for joining us. Hi, good morning. Thank you for having me. Of course. Now, World Suicide Prevention Day, can you just provide some context in terms of why we see the need to observe a day like this? Sure. Hi, I'm Kimberly. So, World Suicide Prevention Day is acknowledged every year on September 10th. Um, and it was created in 2003 by the International Association of Suicide Prevention in collaboration with the World Health Organization. Um, the reason why we acknowledge this day is because the like, statistics show that there's 700,000 persons that attempt suicide every, single, um, every year. And uh, the day is aimed in one to increase awareness, public health awareness, um, reduce stigmatization, and encourage persons to access mental health services. And um, I'm thinking every year there's a theme. Do you know the theme for this year? Yeah, so this year, in fact, for the last, um, in tw from 2021 to 2023, the theme is creating hope through action. And how do you think we can create hope through action? I think one of the things is first understanding the, the mind, the psyche of a person who is suicidal. And uh, um, a key factor is that what leads, what increases the likelihood of suicide is the sense of hopelessness. So generally, a person that is very suicidal, they have this pervasive sense of despair and hopelessness. And what we want to do is instill hope that there is some sort of support or help or there are people that care about you. And uh, um, you know that there is a way to reach out but I like to change dialogue a bit, and rather than saying, you know, reach out, I'd rather encourage persons to reach in. Because for the person who is suicidal, it's very hard to reach out. Yeah. Now, I know that sometimes when we hear about, you know, people uh, dying by suicide, mm -hmm. we often hear, you know, relatives and close family members saying, we didn't know that this person was suicidal. Mm -hmm. Are there warning signs that you can look out for um, to, to, to see if it is somebody are having those suicidal thoughts? Yeah, definitely. Um, and in my recent article I wrote um, for the Loop TT News was that there are signs, you know, a lot of times we don't see it. So it's important that we are aware of these signs and there's a number of different signs. One of the key things is a person may have suicide ideation. And by that we mean that they're having thoughts but verbally expressing it. So for instance, they may say, you know, um, I, I don't feel to be here anymore or um, what's the sense, I don't see the, the sense of living, or what's the purpose of being here, or I'd rather just not be here. So th there's that connotation underlying sense of, you know, that uh, I don't want to be here. Okay. They may not necessarily I w say I want to die, but there is like an, um, you know, a, a sense that I don't want to be here, I'd rather be somewhere else. Um, and most times it's because of the pain that they're experiencing. So it's like they want to escape from that pain. Um, they may all you may also notice that they begin to like give away possessions. So you see it a lot in the elderly where they begin to um, give away possessions, or even other young persons, different age groups, where they would give away possessions or clear out their apartments or their homes because they're beginning to make plans. Um, so they put things into place. Yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to go back to something that you mentioned in terms of. Um, people always say reach out, but you want them to reach in. Mm. And so how is it that the person who is having those suicidal thoughts, you want them to reach in? How does that process work? Yeah, it's more about society as a whole, so civil society. So we as you know, talk show hosts or community <coughs> leaders or um, teachers, it's about noticing the signs and asking that question. You know, are you feeling suicidal? Is something going on? I notice that you know, you're not sleeping or that you're a bit more irritable or restless or you're engaging in like risky behavior, increased um, drugs or alcohol use and saying, you know, is something going on? 
So that's where the reaching in comes in. So it's kind of like being your brother's keeper and kind of ensuring. Because I know now mm -hmm. there's the, the, the tagline, mind your business. But I think we've, we're so far removed from that now yeah. and people need people to reach out to them yeah. and just checking from time to time. Definitely. Yeah. When we mind our business, someone dies. Yeah. You know, and it is about reaching out in order to save a life. Now, I know that you're a psychotherapist, uh, Dr. Vera Simon. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering how do your services um, assist someone who may be having those suicidal thoughts? Yeah. So I am a counseling psychologist, and therefore I look at suicide from a humanistic perspective. I work at Therapeutic Spaces Counseling and Psychotherapy, which is in Tunapuna Paji. And what a person can do is that they can call us. Um, our number is on the TTAP, the Trinidad and Tobago Association of Psychologists. Um, website uh, or they can google us and they can find our phone contact or they can email us um, my assistant she will take that information and then what I do is I call retain the call and do an initial phone consultation so from that I can determine if it is a person is having suicidal um, ideation mild moderate or severe depending on the nature of it either I would see them or one of my trained therapists would also see them as well and so how does, because I know with counseling and psychology, <coughs> but how does psychotherapy work to assist someone who may uh, require your services? So if we were to look at the treatment of um, suicide itself, there, there are different pathways. One could be psychiatric care, one could be psychotherapy. <coughs> so psychiatric care, a lot of times effective treatment, the gold standard for it is a combination of both psychiatric care and psychotherapy. So we liaise, both with, we liaise with psychiatrists as well in order to um, monitor their medication. Not everyone that is suicidal needs to be on medication. Um, if it's mild to moderate, then talk therapies, which was what we provide, could also be helpful. And when we assess risk, we would uh, determine um, what type of treatment that we would work with the client. Interesting. Do uh, <coughs> Is the fact that some people might be diagnosed with certain disorders, can that amplify their ideation for suicide as well? So in terms of causes, um, so there's, not, there's no one cause. Suicide is very multifaceted. So the etiology of it is quite complex. But we have found that persons are suicidal may have an underlying mental health condition, such as depression, anxiety, PTSD, some sort of trauma. Yeah. Now, if uh, the person is, uh, is having the suicidal ideation because they're living in a certain type of environment, um, but they may not necessarily have the, um, the wherewithal, I would say, to leave that environment, how do you create a plan and guide them to a positive type of living mm -hmm. while they're still in that environment. Yeah, um, and that's one of the things with treatment is that if it is that you're still in that environment or the stressor that is perpetuating your suicidal thoughts, therapy could be unhelpful unless it is that you take a psychosocial approach. So that's where we would liaise with a social worker probably to assess the home environment and see if they can make um, accommodations to, to get that person out of the home especially for vulnerable persons, so for instance, children or young people of child sexual abuse or some sort of trauma that's happening in the home. Mm. And if they are can't be removed, then it has to be treatment and a combination of coming to see a therapist. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And sometimes if it's a young person, it's also working, or young person or child is working with a parent. Mm. As well. mm. Now, I was wondering, as you mentioned, young people, do you see different reasons when different people come in based on ages? So for example, is the reason that a young child might be having suicidal thoughts, is it different from a mature person and even an elderly? Yeah, because um, you know the, the etiology of it is, is quite complex and there would be different factors. Um, now for an older person, there would be a series of different factors. So for instance, predisposing factors, meaning that there's a genetic predisposition. You can have a genetic predisposition to suicide. Yeah. I did not know In that. In terms of you. like a, a mental health issue. So yeah. if it is that a, a parent has depression or anxiety, you're 50 times more likely to also have that genetic predisposition. Um, as well as if there's adverse childhood experiences. So for instance, bullying, school bullying or bullying in the home or some sort of trauma, um, either child sexual um, either sexual, physical, or emotional abuse in the home. And so what sort of reasons do you see with the younger people coming in? And again, what are the age groups coming in from the younger people? Yeah, um, sometimes we have as, as young as nine years old, 
where they would feel suicidal. Um, what presents with them would be either bullying, self-esteem issues, a sense of social isolation, so the feeling like they don't have fears, um, friends or they don't belong to peer groups. Um, it could also be parental separation or divorce, um, anxiety, so anxiety is quite common, mm. um, and sometimes even body image issues, which mm. leads to eating disorders. Did you see uh, more people coming to access your services during the, the COVID-19 pandemic? Yes, definitely. In fact, um, that's what led my practice to expand to five therapists. It, it started off with myself, and by mid-2020, there were so many persons accessing um, the service that I didn't want to have waiting lists, so that's when I brought in some other therapists. Was there a certain age group requiring the services more than more than others? Um, at that time, at the beginning of the pandemic, it was more elderly persons, mm -hmm. so persons between their 50s, 60s, more so because they were experiencing health anxiety and they thought it was COVID that they were contracting. Mm -hmm. One of the things uh, you didn't mention, uh, Doc, and I'm, I'm just wondering how prevalent it is, um, some people would go to cutting when they're having those ideation. Is that something we see a lot of locally in our local law? Uh, there is. Um, so we call that self-harming. The correct term is non-suicidal um, self-injury. And th the difference with self-harming is that uh, a person is deliberately causing harm to their body without the intent of suicide. Mm -hmm. So that it's not necessary that they want to die, but what they want to do is alleviate the pain that they're feeling. And therefore, they would resi um, resort to, to cutting. Is this similar to, let's say, somebody cutting their hair as well? I know sometimes they want to cut their hair or they just want to change their appearance. So is that different and linked to abuse? Well, it, it's different. So yeah. it's not self-harming. Yeah. It's more in terms of identity and finding themselves and trying to uh, create a niche within themselves. Um, the self-harming is more deliberate harm to yourself. So for instance, cutting, burning, um, you know, hitting yourself, those things. And uh, doctor, again, before we close, if we notice somebody, just to remind us, if we notice somebody who may have that suicidal thoughts, what can we do? How can we reach out? Is it as simple as just checking in to ask if you're okay? Yeah. Um, the first thing, like I would always say, is like I notice. You know, I notice that you're not sleeping. I notice that you're missing work. I notice that, um, you know, that you're a bit more sad or tearful. I'm wondering what's happening. Is everything okay? So I would say first, like asking, right? As well as uh, listening is important, but listening empathically. So listening without judgment so that you create space so that person could be heard. And any more, uh, anybody who may be having those suicidal thoughts, is there a number that they can call so that they can get um, at least uh, interim care before they seek treatment? Yeah, um, so there's like 800 safe, there's a which is Lifeline. Um, for young people, there's also the child line. They have a 24-hour service hotline, as well as Children's Authority. They also have a, um, a hotline for young people to call. Um, the Rape Crisis Society, they have a 24-hour hotline as well. So if you Google those things, the, the numbers would come up. Dr. Varasamy, thank you so much for coming in and just sharing a little bit about uh, suicide and how we can help and be our brother's keeper in the fight against it. Thank you so much. Thank you for having mm -hmm. me. <laughs> and that was Dr. Crystal Jane Varasamy, the Director of Therapeutic Spaces Counseling and Psychotherapy. You're on the Now Morning Show. We're going to take a break and be right back. Stay with us. <laughs>